Hello, and welcome to a demonstration of Gazang's Z-Encrypt, a data at rest encryption solution. We're going to be running this demonstration today on a Rackspace public cloud server. You can see here I have an Ubuntu image, 4 gigs in size, that we'll be utilizing today. However, Z-Encrypt can run in your private cloud or your hybrid cloud, so you can use the same encryption solution across your Rackspace infrastructure. We're going to be utilizing Datastax Enterprise today. It comes with a Wikipedia demo that has quite a few Wikipedia pages in Cassandra indexed by Solar for us to search. So you can see here that I can search through here and bring up the applicable Wikipedia pages. So what we're going to do with this demonstration is we're going to look at this data that we're seeing right now through the web interface at rest. We're going to search through it, then we're going to encrypt that data and see how a root user will no longer be able to access it but we can actually allow the processes that we want to access it through process-based access control lists that will in the same time block out processes we don't designate. We'll also show that this is a transparent data encryption solution. So it doesn't require any changes to Datastax Enterprise to put this encryption solution in place. It would be the same way with your own application. No matter what application you're using, you won't have to make modifications to the application of this encryption is actually transparent to the application and beneath it. So if we take a look at where our data we were just looking at is on disk, so var lib Cassandra, we see here we've got our solar directory and within that we have all of our database files. A root user can come in here and running strings can actually search the root and pull data out. So if we want to have a separation of duties and we want to make sure that a root user can come on, they can perform the duties they need to to maintain the server, but they don't have access to the data we want, we want to encrypt this data and restrict access to it. So we see here I've run strings on one of the database files. I search for Austin the same as I did in that web interface, and I'm able to pull all of the entries of Austin out. So this could be names and social security numbers that a nefarious user is actually going to dump out and use um, in a way that may lose trust with your clients or break possible compliances. So let's protect this data. We're going to stop DSC. We want to make sure that the uh, service accessing the data is stopped before we do run the actual encryption. Once that's stopped, we're going to double check and see that that is indeed stopped. So we're going to run a command called zencrypt new and we select whether we're going to encrypt or decrypt the data, we're going to encrypt it. We're going to put the category for the process-based access control list. And this is a name that you come up with on your own, so here I've called this Wikidata. And this is going to be associated with the access control list rules I've created for the Cassandra, the DSE processes um, that I want to be able to access this encrypted data. I'm then going to put the point I actually of data I want to be encrypted. So in this case, it's going to be var lib Cassandra data. So I'm going to go ahead and encrypt that whole data directory. Now you could also encrypt just specific files or directories like this or multiple directories. So you can really make sure to just encrypt the data that you need to, to actually protect. Then I'm going to specify my encrypted mount point. And we'll talk more about this in just a moment. So with that, I'm going to then need to type in my master passphrase. My master passphrase I created when I set up zencrypt. Very simple install. We support all of the common Linux package managers. And once it's installed, you need to pick a passphrase. It needs to be at least 16 characters. And this is the passphrase that has to be entered before any kind of uh, changes to the configuration. So if you don't want root user or another user to have access to be able to do this, simply don't provide that passphrase. And that's going to lock them out of being able to unencrypt the data. So with that, we'll see that the data is moved from var lib Cassandra data into my encrypted data point. Once that's done, and I do the same kind of listings that I was just doing, so ls-l and var lib Cassandra data, and we're now going to see that that's become a symbolic link to my encrypted data location. So as a program comes in here and wants to utilize the data that was here, it's going to actually be checked whether it's allowed to traverse and access the data unencrypted. I'm running ls. ls is actually a program. 
I haven't given it access to that data. So if I run it to actually see within the data directory, I'm now going to get a permission denied. So even the root user can't go into this data unless the application that's being run and they have access to has been granted access to this data. So let's look at how some of this was set up to run this command. If we look at our file system, we'll see I have var lib Cassandra storage. This is actually my encrypted storage location. So the data was moved from the original location to the encrypted location, and we're utilizing the mount point to point to that encrypted location. I set that up with a command called zencrypt prepare. I also set up some ACL rules ahead of time. If I list those out, again using that master passphrase, we'll see that there's my Wikidata category. I have two Java processes that I've actually given access to the data. They're both DSE processes that require access in order to have that web front end that we first looked at. Now, these are Java processes, so we're giving access to Java, but we want to restrict it down to just the processes that we need, in this case, DSE. If we just allowed Java to access, then anything else that was running as Java would be able to see the data. So profiles allow us to add additional criteria to further restrict it to make sure it's the correct Java process. If I list that out, we'll see that we have a line here along with our Java program binary that we're specifying to allow access. And we're also putting things like the user ID it's running as and the full command line. All of this is going to be uh, compared before we actually allow access to the data. Now, this process, it isn't just a check of the name. It's actually a check of a fingerprint that's taken when you first create this ACL rule. So what does that mean? It means you have another security check. If that binary is modified, be it through an update or through a potential attacker who's modified that program, we're no longer going to allow access to that data by that process. It will no longer match the fingerprint. So it's another check that if something happens, either an out of turn update or a, pro a process replacement, you'll have notification because you won't be able to access that data. So all you need to do to avoid that is during a part of your standard process upgrades, rerun the ACL command and it will re-fingerprint that process and allow you to proceed and grant that proper access. So now that we've moved our data, we've looked at how we set up the directory, the encrypted directory. We also looked at those process based access control list rules. We've got everything set in place to go ahead and start our service back up. So let's clear our screen so we can see it. And we're going to go ahead and start that process back up. Make sure it's running. And now that that process is running, let's go back to our web interface and see if we can still access it. So we see we have the same interface as before. We can search for our phrase, bring that information up. Now, if we go back as the root user, we see our symbolic link. Now we're actually gonna look down that data directory and we see permission is denied. So unless you gave someone permission to access this web interface, the root user or any other users that have a high level of access in the server aren't going to be able to access this data unless they're coming through the processes that have permission. So if you do give a user access through a username and password into the application front end, they'll still be able to see the data. But the great thing is we're protecting that data at rest when it's sitting on the server, giving a separation of duties, allowing your system administrators to still do their jobs. So let's go ahead and stop DSE again. And now we're going to unencrypt the data. So we're going to move it back to its original location, take away that symbolic link, and put it back into place. So with this, we just do a Z encrypt move. We de encrypt. And we put our original location. We put in our master passphrase. We want to make sure that only the right users that have proper access are allowed to decrypt the data. And we see it's moving from our encrypted location back to our original data location.
So now when I do my varlib Cassandra, instead of seeing a symbolic link, I'm going to see the same thing we saw at the beginning of our demo, a list of the directories. So now we can bring DSE back up. It'll be just like it was at the beginning with just a few simple commands. So I hope that we've been able to demonstrate today how easy uh, Zencrypt really is to, to encrypt your, your data at rest. This is a requirement for quite a few different um, compliances out there, be it HIPAA or PCI, as well as just being able to tell and ensure your customers that their data is protected um, from an attack and from users who shouldn't have access to that data. Thank you for your time, and I sincerely hope you've enjoyed our demonstration.